So James 1, chapter 1, 19 and 21, which reads, James 1. You read James chapter 2. You jump to there? Don't. Master chapter 1. Find out what salvation is there because James is addressing in chapter 2 those who are believers by virtue of 1, 19 and 21. This you know, my beloved brethren. What do you think these are? Believers! But everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted. It's already implanted in you. You're believers, which is able to save your souls. It's planted in you to save the value, the preservation of the length of your years and the value of your life for eternal rewards. And prove yourself doers of the word. You're talking to believers here. Now you go into James chapter 2. We're not talking about salvation unto eternal life there. We're talking about brethren here. Salvation later on is how you act as a believer in James chapter 2. Faith without works is dead. It's inactive. Can a man without works be, be saved? Save your soul. The value of your man without works, can you have a valuable soulish life, physical life, that will earn rewards in heaven? No. You can't have salvation of your life if you haven't been faithful, but you can have salvation if you believed. Two different concepts. In any case, James 1, 19 to 21 is definitely not a salvation unto eternal life. A passage, eternal, eternal life passage. The two conditions given, not practicing sinfulness and receiving God's word with respect to living righteously are repeatedly given in scripture as conditions for believers to meet for discipleship and not for unbelievers to satisfy in order to be saved. You know, once you get a job by faith, by, uh, by faith in your capacity to do the job, in temporal life, now you got to keep faithful with the job to keep the job, but not here, not salvation. You keep your salvation whether you're faithful or not. James and all the authors of Scripture call upon believers to avoid sinning and to apply God's word in order to grow as believers, to please God, to avoid temporal discipline, and to lay up treasure in heaven. That's called rewards, folks. Judgment seat of Christ. Compare the following passage to verify that Scripture does indeed instruct and command believers not to sin and to stay in fellowship with the Lord. Look at all these. The key to understanding James' epistle is understanding that James is saying that the believers are to serve God instead, and not instead to serve themselves or instead their fellow man. James is telling fellow believers in one, James 1, 19-21 that they must give up their sinful lifestyles and start obeying God's word in order to save themselves from losing their physical lives on earth. From early physical death. <coughs> which includes the cutting short of the time the soul spends on earth in the physical body doing the Lord's work or not. For the soul departs from the body upon physical death. If nothing was produced by that soul, well in the body due to sinful lifestyle, then that soul has wasted himself and will have nothing to show for the time his time of worth on earth his temporal life will have been worthless. What kind of rewards did he get for that? None. Nothing he did will be saved in heaven for all eternity. Thus we have arrived at the meaning of James 2.14, which was discussed on page 16, on the previous page. I say discussed earlier. James 2.14, this is part of my term paper here. What use is it, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that save faith him? Faith, uh, save him? From premature physical death and loss of eternal rewards? Answer, no. <clears throat> Good idea when you become a Christian. Go to 1 John 1, 9, talk about how to stay in fellowship with God so you don't lose your salvation. It's a matter of confession of known sins a moment to moment. And look up in the back if you have a good index in the back. You should have one. And look under the words, rewards. Matthew 24, 13 continued, But the one who endures to the end, it is he who shall be saved. 
compare other passages which deal with the subject of the physical death of a believer, of not enduring to the end of one's appointed years on earth due to a sinful lifestyle. I would say early. Not according to your appointed years. You have appointed years, but you can cut that short. Just test God by turning your back on him. See how long you last. The following passages indicate the consequences of a believer, to a believer, for a persistency sinful lifestyle, a life without much divine good production. 1 Cor 8, 9-11. A Christian perishes, dies due to a weak conscience and his consequent sin. A believer dies physically because he violates the sharing in the Lord's Supper with serious mental attitude sin. 1 Cor 11. 1 John 5. The sin that leads to physical death in a believer is indicated as the truth. Leviticus 10, 1-2, Aaron's sons, Nabab, Nadab and Abihu, die immediately of their sin before the altar of, of the Lord. Acts 5, 1-11, husband and wife physically die due to sin, Ananias and Sapphira. Although immediate death of a believer due to sin is not the norm, sometimes scripture warns that the sin will cut a life short. Ezekiel 18, 4 and 20, the soul that sins shall physically die, nephesh, the soul, the invisible and immaterial life principle, of a living being, as in Genesis 2.7. Proverbs 10.27, the fear of the Lord adds length to life. There you go. Fear of the Lord, acting faithfully, but the years of the wicked are cut short. Doesn't say that they don't have eternal life. Now you can be a, a, a extra wicked unbeliever and die early as well. Ecclesiastes 7.17, do not be over wicked, and do not be a fool, why die before your time? Proverbs 11, 19, The truly righteous man, the believer who stays in fellowship with the Lord, don't forget to confess, attains longer physical life. Life is physical life. But he who pursues, pursues evil, whether believer or unbeliever, goes to his physical death before his time. Everybody dies. So obviously we're talking about living out the length of the years that God has appointed, or having God cut that short. Proverbs 14, 27, The fear of the Lord fearing and thereby obeying him, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. Fountain is a source or a well of spring. Life is physical life. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn away one wife from the snares of death. Snares of death, those traps, the lures which tempt the believer to sin and thus hasten one toward early physical death. James 1.15 Sin, when it is full grown in the believer, brings forth physical death. James 5, 19-21, the believer who enables another believer who is sinning as a matter of course in his life to turn his life around will save that simple brother's soul, believer's soul. In other words, save his physical life. There is much to be said for the value of the inner peace and joy which obedience to God's word brings. I have that. I just have a problem with my temporal life being unhappy. I have to focus more on eternity. Some of the unhappy things in this life brought upon by just my constantly sharing my faith. That's part of the job. This inner peace and joy provides a longer life of better quality than the life-shortening, depreciating value of turmoil, guilt, and bitterness, and anger, etc., which disobedience to God's word brings. Finally, let's ask the question. If any of this benefit to longer life can apply to unbelievers or even to salvation unto eternal life in heaven, is James speaking to unbelievers in his letter? Is James speaking about eternal life? All of the exhortation James does to his readers to repent and clean up their lives cannot apply to unbelievers. Unbelievers cannot accomplish this because they cannot please God. They are slaves to sin and do not have the capacity to repent and clean up their lives. Compare Romans 8, 5 to 8. Therefore, James' appeal, James's appeal must be to fellow brethren believers. Brethren is mentioned a lot. Furthermore, since the destiny of every believer is eternal life in heaven, no matter what, and we have all these passages, then James cannot be referring to eternal damnation, death, and hell. He is not therefore referring to salvation to eternal life, but to saving oneself from an early physical death. I can't tell you how many people that give up on staying healthy, serving the Lord, not turning life away from God because of ostracism of people who are against Christianity or philosophically I don't want to hear about it. And uh, so it's not a happy thing. But it's, uh, if you decide to compromise, 
you know, lead into those things that unbelievers do or unfaithful believers to shorten their lives physically, medically speaking, as well as emotionally speaking. You don't have this gusto for living for the Lord for the lie on eternity. His hope, sure hope for his eternal life and perhaps for the rapture. Just remember this, if you die in your physical life, you live out your years, you'll be present with him immediately. I'm hoping to, re to reach the rapture, but then I'm thinking, I don't know if I want to go through the unbelievable danger it will be towards the, just the, the moment w in which the Gentiles, the unbelieving world, is so dangerous to live around these people that you're liable to lose your life earlier and you'll die anyway. So, and, and perhaps in a more peaceful time, if I go before the rapture and go to be home with the Lord, uh, in, in a natural setting, my demise will be a lot more peaceful. So returning to our passage in Matthew 24, 13. But the one who endures to the end, it is he who shall be saved. The believers of the tribulation period are in view, not you and I. You persevere to the end, you endure to the end, you'll, have, you'll save your physical life, and you'll be transformed into perfect human beings and live into the millennial rule. But those are believers who became believers after the church has left the planet. So, the believers of the tribulation period Non-church believers, that's the Mosaic Law period, the last two, uh, last seven years. The believers of the tribulation period who are faithful, who endure in their walk with God to the end. That will be really, really tough. We'll physically survive the tribulation ordeal, and I mean an ordeal, and will continue to remain physically alive in their natural bodies and begin life in the millennium period under God's rule, Christ's rule, having been transformed into remarkably uh, in, uh, enduring physical individuals who will live on into the millennial kingdom for many, many years. Many years. As in the times before the flood. Those are for the believers that become believers after the rapture, not part of the church. Not so for unfaithful believers who will not physically survive, but go home to be with the Lord prematurely. Unfaithful believers will go home to be with the Lord prematurely, suffering a tremendous loss of eternal rewards in heaven, unless they were chosen to be faithful martyrs in the service of the Lord. Also, those believers whom God has chosen to be martyrs will also not be physically surviving to the end, but will receive the tremendous crown of rewards for going up, up, giving up their life for the Lord and all that that entails in eternity. Finally, at the end of the tribulation, physically surviving unbelievers will be put to death by our Lord and then cast into the lake of fire. So, at the end of the tribulation period, physically surviving unbelievers will be put to death by our Lord and then cast into the lake of fire for eternal condemnation. That's called the judgment of nations. Don't confuse that with the uh, great white throne judgment or the rapture. And they're different times for these events. These words of the Lord have an application beyond his own lifetime. What was proclaimed here was more fully demonstrated in the apostles' lives after the day of Pentecost in the spread of the gospel of the church. But these words will find their fullest manifestation in the days of the tribulation period when the gospel will be carried throughout the entire world, not just AD 70's world, 
before Jesus Christ returns in power and glory to establish 